Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 392 for Monday, August 7th, 2023. <music> Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by four and about working musicians here where I was last week, which is kind of a nice thing to be in the same place two weeks in a row in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Back in Napomo, California. It's Paul Kent. Ah, so we're both home, home ish. Home, home. Home, yeah. home. Yeah. Yeah. How, uh, how goes? It goes. I had a crazy busy week last week and, and I wasn't feeling right. And I actually, was under the weather and actually ca- canceled. I wish I. Uh oh! Did we Here's... lose you, Paul? Did you uh, accidentally turn your mic off or something? I, nope. All right, you're back. I can hear you now. All right. Oh, weird. Yep. So uh, you you right. canceled the gig yesterday? Is that right? Yeah, I, I I took the day off yesterday. I just I didn't have anything left. I got back from a family vacation late last Sunday night ah. and played played Monday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, three house rocker gigs and one acoustic gig. And, uh, and I felt it kind of coming on. So maybe it's crud I got on the, you know, when I was on vacation, Sure, but I just was, I was out of gas. I was out of gas Saturday and we had a, a pretty big house rocker gig and I, and I knew how I was feeling driving to that gig. And that's, that's when I, I, I called the client and just said, yeah, you, you should sub this one out for me. And they, they were really cool about it. It's a, a really nice winery. And, uh, they just like, yeah, stuff happens. We got it. That's great. So, okay. So you were able to, to bail out last minute without it significantly causing any negative impact that we know of that we, yes. I mean, there's always, everything is cumulative, right? So, it, you know, if you've played 15 gigs for them and you bail on this one, they know you're reliable. Like it's, the, but you do this enough and they'll be like, Oh, maybe that Paul guy's not as reliable, but. But uh, yeah. but they seemed cool about it yesterday, so that's good. Uh, we'll, t- we'll take it. We'll take it. But yeah, yeah. The House Rockers. We played three times last weekend. Absolutely killed it three times, and there were three big shows, big crowds, huge, like anywhere from a thousand to three thousand people, and um, we just we got in that groove, and we were just kill- even even mistakes the band made. Yeah, the the band covered for those mistakes, glossed them over and kept going. Russ started a, a wrong song. <laughs> uh, and, and you know, that means something in a 10 piece band where the horn's got to get to the chart. And, yeah, and yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on when a, when a wrong song starts and, and, uh, but you know, within five seconds, everybody was, everybody was there. It was kind of fun, but mostly that's actually just- amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes that like, I remember a bitter pill gig, earlier this summer back in July where I started the wrong song and, and it, that was, it was not going to work because Billy was Billy switches between bass and cello, which he plays mm. a, a, as a bass ish kind of thing. And uh, he was on, I think he was on his bass uh, and, and I started the wrong song as it, which was a cello song. And it was like, uh, yeah, this isn't going to work. <laughs> they just so, stopped. Yeah. We just stopped. It was fine. It, 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 Nobody you know. died. What's that? Nobody died. Nobody. Act, it was, it was at the, um, uh, that m- music hall lounge in Portsmouth. So it's very much a listening crowd and everybody's sort of paying very close attention to everything. It's the place where people shush each other, which is awesome. Uh, I, yeah. um, at least from my standpoint. Yep. And so it, it, it gave them a peek into it, it, what we were doing. I mean, it was already a fairly open thing. And so like that little moment really, uh, it, it probably endeared uh, us to them even more. So it worked, it worked out fine. It was not, it was not a, like you said, nobody died. It was great. It was fine. Yep. Is everybody in the band comfortable when something like that happens? Yeah. 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 And bitter pill. I mean, you know, everybody in that band has some version of theater experience, um, which is not entirely different than just playing on a rock and roll stage for most of your life, Uh, you know, but that, that confidence of, yep, I've been here before where there've been unpredictable things that have happened. And sometimes the audience doesn't know, and sometimes they do. And if they do, you acknowledge it because that's the best way to get through it is, you know, if they, it, there's, there's a, 
a a sort of a maxim in theater. If something falls on the floor, pick it up. Don't ignore it. Like everybody sees that it fell on the floor. If you don't pick it up now, that's where all the attention is. It's like, why is that thing still on the floor? Right. You know, so it's that same kind of thing. It's like, yep, we're aware. Everybody knows we're just going to we're just going to acknowledge it and everything's OK. And, it, you know, yep. it adds to the show. Yeah, it's live entertainment. Like that's it. It's, it's OK. Real. Yeah. Yeah. We have um, our regular drummers coming back and his first gig with us will be this coming Friday. Yay. Nice. He's yeah. doing okay and all that good stuff. He's coming back on Friday. So I'm going to guess he's been cleared. for Yeah, I, I guess that's fair. Yeah, that's right. You're not, a, you're not a doctor. <laughs> you might, you yeah. might play one on a podcast every now and then, but that's it. So, so we gave Russ a big thank you for getting us through the summer. Yeah. Cause remember it was literally the beginning of our busy time in May that Russ came on board and played all May, June, July, right. And the first week of August. And he was great. The band was cooking under him. It was so fun. And it was a you know it's a bittersweet thing. We're, get, we're happy to have our regular guy back, of course. But you know, but we were we were a pretty well oiled machine for there. And, and Russ felt the same way. Like he really had a good time. He's not doing a whole lot of big band stuff these days. He's doing a lot more like you know cajon small yep. kit type things. So he said it was really fun to like bang drum and and uh, and he had a good time and we had a lot of laughs and and it was all real good. And uh, now, I mean, Don is a perfectionist and he, as is Russ. I will be extremely surprised if Don is not, I mean, I don't know what rust is going to look like, but uh, rust, R-U-S-T, not R-U-S-S. Uh, th thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But um, it'll be, it'll, it'll, it'll certainly be different. They hit different. Sure. And, uh, and uh, it'll be so interesting to see what muscle memory comes in. I, I, I'm kind of looking forward to it, right? I mean, both great drummers yeah. that do things slightly differently that at, you know, certain things and certain songs come out differently that are really fun. We've been on a great groove and literally slaying people. Like, like our last two songs, generally our encore is that version of long train running that I shared with you that has the horn chart from uh, Doobie brothers live at wolf trap or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the then, doobies do it with the, they, they, they had the tower power horns or some version of the tower power horns with them. I think for a little bit where they, they, they merged like soul faction into the end of, of long train. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That, that version. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And then uh, we go into um, love train, the OJ song mm. and, uh, and invariably a conga line breaks out and a train breaks out and, and uh, we've just been getting the energy up so high and the last gig that we did, which was a Saturday night, it was really hot. It was about 100 degrees of downbeat outside. Oh. And, uh, and it was a, you know, it was a sitting crowd that certainly the first set, while the sun was still out and it was still quite hot, was definitely sitting. And we were working pretty hard. Second set, we got them right from the first note to the second set. And by the time the energy built to the end, I mean, we had two... Hundred person conga lines going around this park. Wow. It was great. That's awesome. Oh, that's that's great, cool to see. Man. Yeah, that's yeah. really cool to see. Yeah, that's great. Oh, nice, man. That's great. But now, now, now we're going to see what happens with the next incarnation. And a nice thing is we had started some songs. The deal with Russ, who was subbing for us, was Russ basically still had all the songs he played with us when he played with us ready to go. Right. Which was a good a good library of songs to choose from. Of course, but there's some other stuff that we prepared with Don that I wasn't going to ask Russ to learn, you know, for just a couple months stint. So sure. So that was the deal, and we'll get to reintroduce some new material and and uh, you know, I still am, I still am flummoxed. We are we with Russ. We played material that we've been playing for a long time. Nobody except guy, and even the guys in the band you get the benefit of that kind of comfort of the show is the show. Yeah. And you, right. And, and we just kind of eased into that, but, um, but I don't know, man, do you update your set list with more old stuff or do you, does anybody care if they're only seeing you two or three times a summer? I, I don't, you know what we, we've bounced that question around a lot here and, yeah. and, and certainly the first part of it, should we update our set list it, it, as members of the bands that are playing the songs, we have our own feelings about this, right? And they're valid. It, you know, if you get bored of playing the songs, okay, maybe that's a reason to update it. Or if you like the comfort level of the show is the show, 
I don't need to worry about it. I, you know, I don't have to think about it all week. I just get there and I know the songs because we've been playing them the same way. And you get to sort of evolve them that way. Like there, there's arguments either way from the, the standpoint of those of us on stage. Right. But the question of yep. the, from the crowd, from the people off stage, I, like I don't go see uh, local bands often enough to have an opinion as to whether they should change their set list because I'm often playing. Right. If I see a local band, it's, it's, you know, once a season kind of thing. I, I generally am not going to see them multiple times. So I feel like that's a question to ask of the audience members. So, I mean, I'll, I'll ask you folks, although I know a good chunk of all of you listening are like the two of us here where you're playing more than you're seeing music. So you might not have an opinion, but I know there are some of you who are out there going and seeing bands and, and just listening to this show to learn more about the inner workings of how that all goes, but you don't necessarily play or don't play often. And that's okay. It's great. So I I'd, I'd ask anybody who has an opinion on this as an audience member, you know, should bands, would you like it better if bands changed up their set lists regularly uh, throughout the course of a given year? Or do you like knowing what you're going to go see? Like uh, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. I, I, I'm curious what, cause I don't know the answer to this question. I don't, I don't even have an opinion on it. Um, well, one way to look at it is, you know, all these various boards and sites and, and groups where bands post their set lists, right? Yep. You're seeing a lot of the same stuff on everybody's set list often. Sure. And so, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and again, it's the stuff that works and it, it, it the question is, the satisfaction of introducing something new versus the tried and true value of something that just works. Right. Yeah. And I don't, you know, I used to, I maybe if you're really good and you know that that's part of your brand is like, you're always going to hear something new from us. Maybe that's a, that's a good thing, but how many wedding bands? I mean, used to be a top 40 thing and you have to, you know, before classic rock was classic rock, right? You know, top 40, that's what you were, that's what people were hiring, what was on the radio then. Yes, right. Top 40. Right. And that's that not, did change, like really, routinely. Yeah, yeah. 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 I don't know. It's an interesting thing. It's been very fun and comforting to know what parts of the show are going to really pop. And it allows a certain freedom of entertainment where you're not wondering if the band is tight enough on the new song and you're not wondering if, if the new song is going to go over. Right. Chris is singing some songs, right? Real super interesting. We, he's singing three songs. This is Chris uh, uh, in, in your other band up, up uh, in yep. Bay area. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Oh, no, there's, there's Chris, the bass player, Chris, and the, house the bass player in the house rockers. Okay. I just needed to, to get this frame set. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Go ahead. So, so he's singing three songs. He's singing cheap sunglasses. Yeah. Harder rock and roll. And uh, uh, addicted to love. Yep. And um, the cheap sunglasses, the horn chart. We wrote an original horn chart on it, and it's really cool. It kind of kind of punctuates that that groove thing in between the verses, and and uh, I think it sounds great. Really interesting. It's not, and and everybody knows that song. That's a that's a staple classic rock song. Yeah. Doesn't seem to quite be getting. Uh, reaction. And I think it's that whole mid tempo thing. Same with addicted to love in the right place. When people are, you know, a little lubed up, that is probably a pretty effective song, but early in the show, it's, you know, it's, it's mid tempo, right? Yeah. You got to watch rock that, and rolls. that mid tempo stuff. Yep. Yeah. Hard rock and roll seems to work of his three songs. It, the one that consistently does a little bit better, gets people singing like into it, but you know, those mid tempo ones are, Hard to place, right? You don't want to take a chance once the once the adrenaline is going later in the show, right? Yep. Or do you? Um. Well, it, like we wind up playing, and I've got some things to share about the Uptown uh, gig that we played the other night. But uh, actually, one song we didn't do. I don't think we did. Maybe we did it at the gig. I can't remember. Um. But one song that we do regularly in that band and and have for years is take me to the river and the the version that we do is not quite as slow as the talking heads did it, which is like right at about a hundred BPM. 
but it's a little bit faster. Not, it's certainly not 120. It's not even 110. It's you know probably 104 kind of thing. What was the what was the commitments version? Oh, I don't know. I can't. I faster. can't. It was faster. Yes, yes, for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so it works. But where we put it is at the end of a set, and. I know that seems like counterproductive, but as we've had people at 120 for, you know, whatever, 15, 20 minutes, whatever it is to slow it down a little bit with a song, they know cold, right? So they're right there. They're already moving to give them a little slowdown that works, especially it's kind of what Uptown does. Like, you know, we end another set with September, uh, which is up, you know, near 120, depending on how you do it. And then drop that down into We Are Family, pulling, shaving about 10 beats per minute off in the transition. Um, mm-hmm. And it works because people are already up. And then both We Are Family and uh, Take Me to the River, the way we do it, have, you know, sing along sections. I mean, Take Me to the River's got that, right. Nah, 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 right? You know, where everybody's kind of into it and it's a nice, fun way to end the set. So it works. But I wonder how it would work. If we did it like, you know, the third song of the night or something, right? Like, mm. I don't, I don't think it would work as well. I, I think you've got to, you've got to give those songs something it, it, in a, in a party vibe, which is what, you know, the two bands that we're talking about sort of go and deliver. If you're going to play something, if you're going to play that change up, it need, you need to define that it is a change up, right? Like you can't expect people to know oh right out of the gate like oh they haven't played 120 bpm yet but they're going to and this is different from that right like mm-hmm. <laughs> you know that as a musician but the, the, you got to you got to give the crowd the energy get them loose get them lubed up and then you know change it up and it works so yeah it makes sense yeah we we for a while are ending shows with ain't no mountain high enough Mm. which would be that that same type of thing but everybody same sings of, it right everybody sings right it's you and it's and that's the other thing is you have to deliver and so i've never met chris i don't know chris uh but i would ask is is he an entertaining performer when he's delivering these songs because that can make a huge difference if he's able to connect with the crowd you know as, as like like nick from behind the keys you forget that he's behind the keys. He's a very charismatic performer. He's engaging. You know, he's, he's, he makes facial expressions. He delivers. You certainly deliver. you know, center stage. I've never seen Chris. So that would be another thing is, is he able to make a connection with the audience in a way that they want to root for him? Or is it just like, Oh, I don't, I don't know who that is. And so I'm going to ignore it. Well, that's a good point. So he's, you know, he's back behind Nick most nights next to the drummer. So Mm -hmm. he, he's kind of in the back of the stage and, He's a great singer. I mean, sure. really pitch and tone is just fantastic. But you do have to kind of look for him singing. And sometimes he's on smaller stages. He's even blocked entirely. So is there a world but, where know, it makes rest- sense to bring him out to your vocal mic when uh, when he sings uh, those songs? That's an interesting question. So he certainly would like to on my vocal mic. So there's the you know, there's the sanitary version of that that i'm so a little queasy about i totally right? get that yeah and maybe just another you know downstage microphone something yeah towards the you know towards the front of the stage so you're not looking to find somebody up in the back yeah yeah that's a good point i don't know and, and, and you know you, well you what you want to do is you want to give them every tool to win that you can that's right? it so right set them up for success <laughs> yes yeah yeah that's a good point that's a good point yeah i don't know i don't know it's um it's it's always there's there's always well as a good friend of mine, and it happens to be you, says all the time, live music is a visual art. <laughs> all right. Hey, look, while you're here, I want to make sure you know about another show that you probably know about already because you're a Gig Gab listener. It's called Cover Band Confidential, right? Hosts Adam Johnson and Dan Ray, they have been on this show. We've been on their show. In fact, we even did a crossover episode together. But if you haven't gone and listened to Cover Band Confidential, you want to go do that, right? Adam and Dan come to you every week with great tips, guidance, and advice to help you, as they say, rock more and suck less. This is all mixed into fun gear reviews, takes from the gig, and the ever-popular gigs from heck, because they try to keep it PG-13. 
try to do that here too. They succeed way better than we do. So you got to go check it out, whether you're a weekend warrior or a hired gun, whether you're playing covers or originals, Cover Band Confidential is your weekly source for how to make good money playing music. So take a second and whatever podcast platform you're listening on right now to search up Cover Band Confidential and give them a listen. You'll be glad they did it. And hey, tell Adam and Dan that Paul and Dave sent you and uh, thank them for doing this swap with us. So I mentioned we played uh, Uptown played on Friday night. It was Friday was a weird day here in uh, the, the middle of New England. Uh, we had one of the wor- along the seacoast of New Hampshire, especially here. We had one of the worst lightning storms I've ever seen uh, in the you know eighteen plus years that we've lived here. It it I I'm a nerd, right? I, all of my stuff is protected on like you know, battery backup things and surge protectors and even all the ethernet and coax lines in and out of my house and office are all protected. Didn't matter. This storm hit so close to everything that it blew out. Actually, it blew out a computer at the house. It blew out some network switches. It was just a crazy early afternoon uh, that this storm blew through. And then we went to set up for this gig, which was only like 20 minutes from my house, which is great. Um, So the weather was, was iffy to say the least it it was not one of those storms that blows through and then the sun just like you know bakes you afterwards it the the, the weather sort of remains um uh, ominous if you will and so it was fine you know we went and set up it was at this a uh, private party at these at a private home uh, gorgeous home these these uh, husband and wife builder team had retired from their their business they had sold their build, like, building business but they'd built their house and they built this beautiful in-ground pool and had this really nice backyard and we get there and they had built a stage for us. The guy's like, oh yeah, I built it myself. And I was like, oh no, a homeowner built the stage, you know? And then I stepped up on it. I didn't realize what he had done for a living, um, you know, until I st- stood on the stage. I was like, this is one of the sturdiest stages I've ever been on. And the, the ground where it was set up was not level, but the stage was level. <laughs> mm. And and he's like, yeah, I built it yesterday. I'm like, okay. And, and he had built it in a way where he had extended uh, two by sixes off of uh, kind of all sides of it to make it so that uh, that big, huge pop-up tent that he put over the stage was actually covered more than just the stage. It covered, you know, past the edges of the stage. It was all well done. Right. So it's like, okay, this is great. So we were set up uh, in case it rained or whatever we set up and we were able to set up and tear down without it raining, which was great. Halfway through the first set, the rain came in and then the first set ended a little early with just a torrential downpour, but we, it, it passed through quickly enough. It wasn't like lightning, like it was earlier in the day. And and so we were able to make it through the gig. It pay, it caused our pacing to be a little weird because we wound up ending, you know, the first set well before we were planning to end it. But it was like, you know, we could, I could see the pool from the stage. And when the pool was like, you know, when there were waves in the pool mm. from the amount of rain coming down, it's like, Oh yeah, we, I think we should probably stop. It's fine. You know, mm-hmm. but, um, but it, it, it worked out well. It was our, our first gig with our new bass player, because I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, he had to bail out last minute cause he was sick. Uh, so we had that sub bass player for what was the first gig of this incarnation of uptown. Uh, so it was our first gig with him. It was also our first gig with this version of the band with our uh, normal sound engineer, which was really nice to have him back. And it was our first gig playing three sets. And that meant we added a bunch of Gary added a bunch of tunes to the set list that we had never rehearsed before. Some of which we had never played before. And one of them was uh, birthday by the Beatles. It was uh, a combination retirement and birthday party. And we found this out last minute. And so he's like, yeah, we'll play birthday by the Beatles. And you know, I am a, you know this about me, Paul. I am I am a, a Beatles fan. I my my approach when playing Beatles songs is do no harm, right? Don't you know? Don't screw them up. And birthday has a weird form, and mm. uh, and you know the harmonies are interesting. And so I was I was I was concerned about it, but it it wound up going well. Um, we added a couple other tunes that we'd never played with this you know version of the band before, and including one that I'm not sure any of us had ever played before um we it was uh the uh, uh mary jane's last dance so pretty straight ahead tune but i don't think we had ever played it before but it it went fine um i'm never a fan of just adding uh, we added you know probably half the second set 
was brand new songs, you know, just for this gig. And it was, a, you know, I mean, these people paid top dollar for this band. And so it was like, okay, guess we got to learn some songs. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm never a fan of that kind of uh, last minute thing uh, for, for a gig where the expectation, where the, you know, where the bar is set. If it, if everybody knows, oh, it's just like a pickup band thing. Okay, that's fine. But uh, when it, when they're not supposed to know that, then I'm always. But it it worked out. Everybody did their homework, and even though we couldn't even sound check these songs, it was it, it worked out fine. I did. It meant that I I had charts going on stage uh, for you know a lot of the the new tunes and even some of the ones that we play or whatever. And I wound up doing something as I was prepping for this that I found very very helpful. And that is for, as I was going through and sort of organize, I use this app on song, uh, on my iPad to like organize the set list. And it, I, I have tempos in there and even a metronome if I want it for certain tunes where I can get a visual click out of it. So I know what, where to start these tunes, um, for, uh, for the songs where I know that I know them. I blanked out all of the cheat sheets so that I wouldn't be tempted to just, you know, lock my gaze on my iPad as we were playing through the song. And it was such a good thing. I mean, there certainly there were some songs where I needed it and I'm glad I had it. Right. But for anything else, it's like, yeah, man, you know, like I don't need a chart for brown eyed girl. I have one. And mm -hmm. certainly I could, I could pull it up, but I'm going to wind up reading along with it if I'm not careful. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, that, that sort of idle distraction. It's like, nope, all I needed to say is play brown eyed girl, Dave, you know, I'll take it from there. I know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? So, I, so I, that crutch forcing that crutch not to be there is I think an important, uh, an important thing to do. I don't know. I did. Do you find yourself like relying on the crutch? If you have it in front of you for those kind of oh, gigs? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's, Really, I, I have a really bad ability to remember lyrics. Mm -hmm. And once I go to the crutch, your brain just knows the crutch is there. That's it. And it's really a, a bad thing. I mean, it's very hard to get off the crutch. It, it is. I, I just had to force myself to do it. And, and, and there were moments of absolute panic, right, where I, I was like, I can't believe we're about to do this song and I don't have the crutch. But it was fine. Like, I know that I know these songs. But there is that, it, you know, that, that, that reliance, right? And uh, I, I made it through everything fine. It was totally fine. Um, but, and it, it's, it's, and, and then I'm able to interact more with the band, interact more with the crowd, watch, Play. you know, perform better, all of those things. Like, I, you know, I know we all know that, but it, it putting it to the test was you know i was i was thinking well I'll always be performing what's one way to make sure i'm doing that well don't give myself a screen to look at that's for sure <laughs> yeah for yeah. sure yeah i um i went and saw extreme the other night um the the, the band from the 90s the mm -hmm. yep yep uh with uh they opened their tour on wednesday night over in maine and so lisa and i went over and saw them and it was Lisa's the first time seeing Gary Sharon perform uh, in a, in a meaningful way anyway. And uh, that guy, I, I want to get him on the show. And I think I probably, I, I know how to reach out to him. I mean, he's busy on tour now, but I, I think we could probably get him on the show because I, I think it'd be really interesting to talk to him about performing. I, I don't, I, I never asked him this, you know, when, when he was at our gigs or whatever, but um. I, I, I have to assume he has some theater training, dance training, something. He knows how to move his body. He knows how to make himself a, a, a folk, a visual focal point in addition to knowing how to sing, right? Like, I mean, he's a fantastic singer, but more than that, he, he understands performance in a, in a really interesting way. And I, I, I think, I think there's probably something we could all learn from him. I, I, he would, I've mentioned on the show before, but the band that I played with when we first moved up here to New Hampshire, uh, he would come out, he was friends with our, our lead singer. He would come out to the gigs, nicest guy in the world, really humble. And, and, and then he would stand on stage and, uh, cause he sat in with us a few times, you know, he would occasionally sit in and 
sing a couple tunes or whatever. And as soon as he walks on stage, he, then he becomes Gary Sharon, the performer, right? Like, yeah. And it, which is great. Like it's, it was, it was really comforting to see that he wasn't always that right. You know, cause that'd be really difficult to deal with if you were like just sitting down and eating pizza together or whatever. Like, very, very humble, you know, soft spoken even until he's on stage and then he's performing. He knows his job. He yeah. knows his job. And, and when you watch him perform, I had forgotten about this. Um, but if you go and watch him perform, he will take moments where he will strike a pose in front of the drum set with his back to the crowd. And I always remembered that it reminded me of, of when he would play with us because he would strike this pose, knowing what his body looked like to the crowd, communicating this confidence and, and, you know, still being that focal point or whatever. But those were the moments where he could like, you know, shut it down. I was the only one that could see because he'd be facing me, you know, if we were on stage or whatever, but it would be, he'd be like, you know, give a smile or whatever and say, Hey, this is going pretty well or whatever. You know, it's like he gets to, he gets to power down for half a second and then, all right, turn it, turn it back on, turn around and let's go, you know, go be Gary Sharon again. And, um, it was, it was interesting to get to see him. And then obviously to hear the, the harmonies between him and, Nuno Betancourt and Pat Badger, like those guys, all three, uh, any of them are capable of being, uh, yeah, of being a lead singer, right? I mean, like Pat actually is the lead singer of a, a local Eagles tribute band called Dark Desert Eagles. And Nuno, of course, has sang many things. Um, but, uh, you know, t the, the harmonies that the three of them put together is are spectacular. So tell that Sharon story about when he was in Van Halen and having, um, having a, a, a teleprompter. Right. Oh yeah. I forgot about, I was actually thinking about that. Cause Marty, our singer in, uh, in Uptown was using a teleprompter the other night that he would like control with his foot. And I, I was reminded of what Gary said. Yeah, it was, it was one of those nights where we were like hanging out after one of our gigs or maybe on set break or whatever. And our guitar player, Bill asked Gary, you know, what, did you, I, I, I guess he asked him, did you use the teleprompter when you were in Van Halen or did you need it or something? Maybe the, the subject came up. He was like, oh yeah, we had teleprompters on stage. And Bill was like, do you need it? It's like, I don't, you must know all those words. He's like, oh no, I know all those words. He's like, but you know, we're playing for whatever, 15, 20,000 people. Anything can distract you in any moment to cause you to forget one line. Right. And Bill's like, yeah, of course it happens all the time. He's like, right. But when they, you, you know, he's like, it's one thing he's like, and, and he was so nice about it. Like, I'm probably communicating it the wrong way. You know, he was, he was not dismissing what we were doing, playing for whatever, a hundred people or whatever that night. He's like, but you know, any line of any people pay a lot of money to come see this band. I'm the fill in guy. And, you know, any line of any song could be the favorite line of that band's entire catalog for one person in the room. And that could be true of every line of every song. You know, you just you got 20,000 people in there. How many lines are there? Could be that that's right. the one that means the most to that person. And they only get to see this band once. And there you are screwing it up because, you know, you, you saw somebody in the front row do something stupid and it distracted you or your monitor wasn't right and it distracted you. He's like, so that's what the the teleprompter was for. He's like, was those moments so that I was certain to have the best chance at not screwing that up. He's like, I, I certainly screwed it up at times. He's like, but I really, that's what the teleprompters were for. He's like, it wasn't to read. It was to have in, in an emergency, you know, in those panic moments. You know, what's so funny about that is just, just think about like, I know when I try to have a cheat sheet on on song or something like that. Yeah. It takes my brain a moment to focus and find, you know, like if you have a whole page of lyrics. Yes. What, what, what to say, right? So imagine the wherewithal you have to have in front of 15, 20,000 people to realize you weren't paying attention for a split second and you're about to get lost and to focus on the, I guess the teleprompter is probably only going to have the line that you're actually on singing. So it might be a little bit easier. Yeah. You've got still, some generally, and I, I mean, I didn't get into that level of detail with him, but, but my presumption is someone was controlling the teleprompter and advancing it. So, you, you know, the top of the screen is the next line you're singing or the line you're singing. And then, you know, below that are the next ones. And it just ratchets up as, as you go. I, it, it, I would presume. My, my point yeah. is more about that, that moment yeah. to realize you're about to forget the next line. Right. Like, <laughs> yes. like for me, 
That that's not a microsecond of a thing to be. Oh, good thing I have a teleprompter. Maybe you can train yourself or something like that. But yeah, mostly it, there's like to me, there's that moment, and then the next moment is like, oh crap, and then the next moment is what do I do about it? Right? Yeah. So yeah. Now I've already screwed it up. Now what? Right? Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah, I noticed we went and saw fish a few nights. You know, while Lisa and I were away uh, before we did the last episode, I guess, and uh, they are now using teleprompters on stage. Which, which was needed, uh, you know, they did not have them for a very long time, but there were certain songs that they either wouldn't play because they couldn't always remember the lyrics or they would try to play them and screw them up, uh, it routinely and then avoid them. And so, uh, it, you know, they, now, I mean, their catalog, I mean, they've been playing for 40 years or whatever, like, it, you know, they, they need, they need to have help. And, but what's interesting about that is that band does not play with a set list. Right. And so there's gotta be somebody, you know, off stage that has access to all of their lyrics, obviously, and, and can control the teleprompters, but somehow needs to be fast enough when they start a song to be like, all right, let's go. Here you go. And they do have, um, like what I'll call crosstalk microphones where there's mics that just now that the whole band is on in ears, um, they, they have a few of them on stage have mics where they can talk to each other. My presumption is whoever's running the teleprompter also hears those conversations so that they can, you know, dial up the lyrics a little faster than, right. you know, if, if they get that warning, but sometimes they'll just segue from one song into another. Now, I mean, I, my guess is that they know most of the lyrics that they need to sing. And so it's not like, oh my God, if they don't pull them up, I don't know what to do, you know, but, it, but you know, that's gotta be an interesting and probably sometimes stressful job, <laughs> but tell yeah. if you're running that teleprompter, man. You can't, you got to be focused it, no matter what band you're in. Even if there is a set list, unless the show is to a click and the teleprompter can be automated along with everything else, right? If it's not to the click, you got to have somebody on point, man, running that thing for however long the show is. And that's that. Absolutely. Yeah. Did you see that video that Adam from Van Band posted of what, what someone hears in their ears, the, the, uh, yeah, the, the bass players in ear mix. audio. Yeah, so right. this is this is in our Gig Gab Facebook group. I'll I'll put a link in the show notes to it. But but uh, yeah, go ahead and explain what what you're talking about. Well, I mean, it, it's a it's a mix is the first thing. But the thing that was fascinating is that there's a there are cues, like you actually hear chorus, yeah, bridge, verse, right? I think like, we've played again, some of Adam's cues because he painstakingly builds these things. I, I think we played a Stevie Wonder one, you know. Uh, um, on the show here, just to give an example a couple months ago, but yeah, it's crazy how tight everything is there. And yeah, yeah, yeah it'll, but it allows him to keep the show, you know, right where well, he needs talk it. Talk about, you know, you were talking about Chris and setting him up for success. This is how he sets his subs up for success. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Soft landing. Soft landing, man. Yes. It's always, that's right. Yeah. Well, yeah, you want to, yeah, it's good. I, um, it, it, living color, it, you know, that the other, the, another sort of hard edge band from the nineties yep. opened up or o is opening up for extreme on this whole tour. And we saw them at the state theater in Portland, Maine extreme sounded good. It, it wasn't great. It was a little, like I would have liked more vocals, but I, like I'm being particular, like you could hear living color. Their sound was so bad that I didn't, it took, you know, a verse and a chorus before I would recognize some songs and we, our seats were literally right in front of the soundboard. Like there, there was no one behind us except for a, a mixing desk and an engineer, you know? And so you would think that where we were sitting would be the best chance of sound being good. And it was just, it was awful. Um, it was weird. Like there was no there wasn't enough body to either the guitar or the bass to hear any tonal reference. Like I couldn't tell you if Corey Glover was singing in tune, he sang in tune with himself. Like I didn't hear him going off of, uh, you know, his intervals were all where they should be. I, I, I never heard enough out of the PA to know, like to hear a chord or anything like that. The guitar was screechy. The bass was just too thumpy. It was just, it was weird. And you know, they use a raise. I mean, this is a, 
you know, whatever, like, I think it probably holds 2000 people, this place or whatever. Like it's, you, you know, it, I've seen plenty of shows there that sound good. And people at, at other shows that have happened since that one on this tour have said the same thing about living color sound. It's just, I don't, I don't know. It's just, it's weird to me to have anything other than nearly perfect sound mm. with any band these days. I mean, the technology is there and it's, it's even within reach for bands like ours, let alone, you know, bands that are actually mounting an entire tour. It just seems strange to me that, that like, like it's easy to go back to the eighties and, and have horrible sound. Cause it's just the way it is. It's like, no, it's not the way it is. I don't know. It's weird. I just, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Um, we have a, uh, I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that. I'm just, I, I guess I'm venting. It's just, I, I'm sort of perplexed as to how you could have sound that bad and no one like that level. at that level and no one like scrambling around, like in a panic to fix it. Like, like if I was the engineer on that gig, I would have, it, 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 I, I would have been trying everything. In fact, the, the very next night I was um, the, the Rochester opera house, which is a couple of towns North of me. Uh, we've played some gigs there. It's a decent sounding room. Uh, I've seen some shows there. They're right now in the midst of a run of SpongeBob. And they asked me to come in and, and uh, help them. They said they were having trouble getting the, vocals to separate from the tracks there's no band for this but they've got tracks that they're queuing and, and playing them all and they're like yeah we're having some trouble just you know getting the, the sound to separate or whatever i'm like okay well that's fine that sounds good i got there and it was much worse than i uh th than than they had led me to believe maybe they thought maybe they were communicating what they thought but you know i get there and it's like i couldn't i, I first of all i couldn't i had to tune it was dress rehearsal because it opened the next night and so I got there basically right as they were finishing like vocal warmups ish. And then they were going to go get into costume and do the dress rehearsal like that. That was that. So I had to tune this actively during a performance, which is like, all right, I like a challenge. Sure. But at first when I got there and I heard it, I thought that they were speaking in like some sort of gibberish SpongeBob language. Mm -hmm. like, seriously. I was like, Oh, this is kind of weird. Like, that's a lot of speaking in a language I don't understand. And I was like, um, nope, that's not what's happening. And I know some of the actors in the cast and like, they're good actors. They have decent diction, like all of the things that, you know, it wasn't like these were like six year old kids or something that didn't understand how to use microphones and needed to be taught. Like, no, these people were using their microphones properly. Everything was good. They know how to, you know, project and speak and all that stuff. And there's a, there's a house engineer and, and he was sort of admittedly green on this part of things. He was, he was great at some of these other things, but you know, tuning the room, not his thing. So I was like, okay. Um, so I'm like, well, and it was just harsh and loud and grating and also unintelligible. I'm like, all right, well, we got to fix the intelligible problem first. And I'm trying to like do some generic EQ. No. So I go through and one by one, I, throughout the first act, I EQ each person's vocal mic, which they're wearing laughs like that are taped to their faces, you know, and that was sort of a fun exercise in frustration because I would get to like somebody's channel while they were talking, just start dialing it in and then, and then they would stop talking and somebody else would talk and was like, oh, I got to jump to that channel. So it was not the most efficient process, obviously, but you know, I'm getting it there and finally I'm like, okay like one or two songs before the end of the first act, I'd finally gotten through everybody's vocal mics. And I was like, all right, at least it's intelligible. I've got the music to where it sounds like music. It's still a little harsh and loud. And I can't figure that part out. Like I know this room sounds better than this, but whatever, like it's maybe it's too late. Like this, at least when people show up tomorrow night, they're not going to want their money back because they couldn't understand what the play was about or the musical was mm. about. Right. You know, so I'm like, all right, and then I decided, you know, I'm going to go up in the balcony and just see what it sounds like up there. Paul, I got up there and they have speakers in the balcony. They've got speakers in the front of the balcony and the back of the balcony. So delays up there. It must have been 110, maybe 120 decibels in the balcony. 
And oh I'm like, God. oh my God. And it, that's what it, it sounded like. Sound was just bouncing around, but they're using a like line arrays where they, it shouldn't be bouncing all that much. I mean, it's a big theater and it was empty. Sure. But it just like, I've been in there before I've done sound in there, played in there. It's just like, it, it shouldn't be this bad. And I, yeah, I get up there and I was like, oh my God. And I, quickly you know i had an ipad connected to the mixer and so i like went and found the outputs for the the you know for both sets of speakers up there and both of them were at like the faders were at plus 10 db like all the way to the top i wish i had taken a screenshot of it because it's just hard to believe how it ever even got that way you know or why it got that way and uh so i immediately brought both of them down to like you know negative 40 db and I, Lisa came with me. My wife came with me. She was, she wanted to learn more about how to like EQ things and the stuff that I was going to be doing. As soon as we realized it was like, you know, emergency mode, she's like, I'm going to let you do your thing without explaining to me. Cause you're not going to have time to do both. I'm like, yeah, thanks. But I looked down at her and this smile came across her face. I'm like, okay, I know, I know what's up now. So I like tuned the balcony to sound. All right. I apologize to the, the poor uh, spotlight operators that were up there. I'm like, it was really freaking loud up here. And they're like, yeah, we know they look like PTSD, you know, victims or whatever. Uh, like, oh my gosh. These poor people. I mean, they, they'd been at a hundred plus DB for an hour, you know, <laughs> trying to learn this show and do the spots the right way. What a disaster. Um, so, you know, I got the balcony sounding good. I came down and it was like warm and happy. All the work that I did, like, pulling out all the articulation of the vocals and everything in, you know, prior to that suddenly made it just sound so luscious and good. And it was like, okay, now I get it. <laughs> it's like, it was great. Like, it's like, how did it get like that? And of course, nobody, nobody remembered. Everybody's like, well, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I was like, yeah, well, I definitely like, I'm not looking to cast blame. I'm just telling you all what it was. Like, this was the major problem, but it was like there was a serendipity to it because if that wasn't the case, I don't know that I would have quite as diligently gone channel by channel and sort of re-architected the sound to get it as clear as I possibly could, despite having this thing just like blaring off the ceiling. Uh, so I think it probably paid off, but man, it was, it was quite a, it was, <laughs> it was like, whew, I didn't know if we were going to make it. Like uh, I was, I was, I didn't know if I was just going to punt and say, I, 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 I'm the wrong guy. I can't fix this problem. Mm. You know, <laughs> it felt good to fix it. And it's, it was nice. I got to basically just sit and watch the second act. I mean, I got picky and would like tweak tiny little things here or there, but uh, you know, basically I just sat and watched the second act and it sounded good. The, the cast is friggin' amazing. The sets are great. Everything's it was, it's a fantastic awesome. performance. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I, I, I never would have known if, uh, if without if having fixed the sound for the first half, but yeah, yeah it's yeah. crazy. Very cool. Yeah. 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 So I don't understand why they didn't do that for living color. Like, <laughs> and even three nights into the tour when people are texting me cause they saw my post about it or whatever. And they're like, yeah, it's still awful. Like, yeah, I, I don't know what to say. Like, this is literally, you have one job, right? Like, Sound good. That's it. There's there's one person there whose job it is to ensure they sound good. Why isn't that right. happening? Like, man, maybe it's a choice. Maybe they want to sound like that. I, I guess the equipment will allow yeah. them to sound however they want. So I guess maybe we have to assume this is a this is a choice. I don't know. Makes sense. We have doesn't make sense, but makes it sense. doesn't make any sense. No, no, no. It doesn't make any sense. Do we have anything else to talk about? I'm good, bro. All right. Yeah, me too. Fun. It's fun getting to vent, fun getting to share stories, fun getting to share little tips, fun getting to talk about uh, Cover Band Confidential with Adam and Dan. All good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Well, that's that. I hope you, uh, hope you get a good night's sleep, my friend. I hope you feel better and are raring Thanks, to go man. tomorrow morning. Yeah, man. No matter how we're feeling, what is that thing we do if we're going to do it? Always be performing. That's it. See you next week, folks.